Good evening and welcome to tonight's live Q&A event here at the Zacharias Institute in Atlanta. Now we were going to be taking part in a skeptics night at the Brooklyn Tabernacle this evening, but unfortunately that event has had to be postponed. So please do keep your eyes open for when it will be rescheduled. And our hearts are particularly with you all in New York tonight where we know things are very intense right now, but also for whoever is watching around the globe, you are welcome here with us this evening. And we are so glad that you can be joining us. My name is Joe Vitali, and I'm part of the speaking team here at Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Now, this is a global organization where we seek to engage with people's questions about faith, culture, and life, and we do so from the perspective of the Christian worldview. Now, I know that in a time like this where we've all been thrust into just global upheaval and extreme anxiety, that it's going to be stirring up all sorts of questions that you may have about what is going on in our world today, what is going on in our lives, the kind of questions like, are we facing this on our own? Are we all just a product of randomness? Or is there someone out there who can help us with this? And if there is a God who does exist, then where is he in this crisis? Does he even care about what we're dealing with? We really value your questions this evening. Thank you for those who've been submitting them, both around the question of the coronavirus, but also broader questions about the Christian faith and life and meaning and purpose. And we look forward to engaging with those questions this evening. For some of you, these questions will be new. For others of you, they may well be questions that you've been wrestling with for a while, but suddenly they just feel a lot more urgent and pressing in the days that we're living through. Helping me answer these questions this evening are two of my teammates. On the left, I have Abdu Murray, who uh, even in sitting down in a chair still looks twice my size. <laughs> now, Abdu is an award-winning lawyer from Michigan, but he's also senior vice president here at Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And then on my right, we have uh, Dr. Vince Vitali, uh, who's director of the Americas for RZIM and director here at the Zacharias Institute and also has the dubious uh, privilege of having been married to me for the last decade. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, talking through your questions this evening. I'm actually going to start with you this evening, Vince, because the topic of your PhD research was looking into what in the philosophical literature is often referred to as the problem of evil, really looking at the question of if there is suffering in the world, does that actually disprove God's existence? So in light of that, I want to begin this evening with the primary question of the hour, certainly the question that I know people all around the world are going to be wrestling with. And as they themselves may be suffering from this virus, certainly their lives are impacted by it in a profound way. But also several, many of them are actually will be having to be at a distance from loved ones and, and wishing they were by their bedside, but not even with them as they themselves are suffering through this pain. So I think the question on everybody's minds is, if God, then why the coronavirus? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Joe. And uh, you know, as you mentioned, I did spend years studying this type of topic, but this why question uh, often is asked by armchair philosophers. And some of us may even have uh, asked the question that way at times in our life, but no one's asking the question in that way right now, that why uh, is being asked with uh, real emotion, mm. and for many people even with desperation. I always try to remember that the first uh, conversation I ever had about suffering, after I had become a Christian in my um, college years, it was with my Aunt Regina, and she spoke with me about some serious suffering in her life and in the life of her son, my cousin, Charles. And after I listened to her speak about this, at the time, I was more interested in the question, the philosophical question, than the questioner. And I quickly began spouting some of my philosophical explanations for why God might allow Charles to have suffered. And uh, my Aunt Regina listened very graciously to me. And then at the end, she said, but Vince, that doesn't speak to me as a mother. And I've always tried to remember that line when trying to respond to this type of question. Jesus was much better than I was at remembering that sentiment. Uh, when his good friend Lazarus was ill, Jesus waited a couple of days before he went to see him. Uh, and Lazarus wound up dying before Jesus got there. And reading between the lines in the passage, Mary and Martha were not too impressed. Lazarus' sisters, and they said, Jesus, why didn't you come sooner? If you had been here, our brother would still be alive. What do you have to say for yourself? And as a Christian, I believe... At that time, Jesus could have given an explanation, uh, but he didn't. The text says that Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse 
uh, in the Bible. And it's very important to me as a Christian uh, that first and foremost, God weeps at the suffering of this world. And that has to be our first response as well. I'll say a couple of other things, but please hear me at the outset to say this is not in any way meant to be an exhaustive answer um, to this question. I do think it's interesting when we talk about something like the coronavirus, in uh, philosophy, it would be referred to as natural evil. And that in itself is an interesting terminology. You, you might think it's an oxymoron. You might think if it's genuinely natural, if it's just the way it's supposed to be, if it's just the way that physics is supposed to operate, well then, is it actually evil? Can you get a moral category like evil out of something which is just physical and natural? And if it's evil, then is it really natural? If it's genuinely evil, wouldn't that make it unnatural and not natural? So it's an interesting terminology. I find myself wondering if actually that classification, if it, if it points towards God rather than away from God, if it points towards a moral lawgiver who can be the ground of a moral standard of moral reality that can get us a category like moral evil, and also towards a narrative that makes some sense of the fact that this seems very unnatural. This does not seem like it's the way things are supposed to be. Another perspective that I'd want to open up here is that you know natural evils, they're not intrinsically evil in and of themselves. If you have a tornado and you are watching it from a safe distance, it can be majestic to behold. It could be beautiful to behold. If you put a virus under a microscope, it could be beautiful to behold. And there's even a category of viruses, friendly viruses. We need them in our body. The vast majority of viruses are not having a bad result, they're having a good result. And in fact, if we didn't have viruses in the world, bacteria would replicate so quickly that it would cover the entire earth and nothing could inhabit the earth, including us. It raises the question, is the problem the fundamental natural features of our universe or is the problem the way that we are functioning in our environment? Could it be the case that we're not functioning, our bodies, the way we're supposed to in the environment that we're in? When a feral child is taken out of all community, out of all relationship that that child was intended for, the child does not function properly in its environment. Could it be the case that we, as humanity, as a whole, are living separated from outside the context of the relationship that we were most destined for, and we're not operating properly in our environment. There's so much more to say uh, about this topic. I'll open up one more angle just for your consideration. Oftentimes when we think of suffering, we think about it like this. We picture ourselves in this world with all of its suffering. We then picture ourselves in a very different world with no suffering or far less suffering. And then we wonder to ourselves, well, surely God should have made me in the other world. Reasonable thought, but potentially problematic because we never ask the question, would it still be you and me and the people that we love in that very different world that we think we wish God had made? In a moment of frustration with my father, this would never actually happen, Dad, but in a moment of frustration with my father, I might <laughs> wish that my mom had married someone else. Might have been taller like Abdu, might have been better looking like Abdu. I would have been better off. I could be thinking this way, but then I should stop and realize that's not the right way to think. If my mom had wound up with someone other than my dad, it wouldn't have been me who came to exist. It would have been a totally different child who came to exist. Well, now imagine changing not just that little piece of history, but imagine changing the way the entire natural world operates. Imagine if we were never susceptible to disease, or imagine if plate tectonics didn't behave the way they did, if the laws of physics had undergone a redesign, what would be the result? And I think one of the results is that none of us ever would have lived. And as a Christian, I don't think God likes that result because I think one of the things he values about this world, even though I think he hates the suffering within it, is that it is a world that allowed for you to come to exist and allowed for me to come to exist and allowed for every person we see walking down the street to come to exist. I believe that God intended you before the foundation of the world, that he knit you together in your mother's womb, that he knew you before you were born. He desired you, and this was a world that allowed for you to come to exist and to be invited into relationship with him. 
Are we going to have all the answers to this question? Uh, no, we're not. But I don't think we should expect to. I was thinking this morning about uh, my one-year-old son, Raphael, and he generally does not understand why sometimes I allow him to suffer. And I was thinking specifically of one instance where they had to do some tests on his heart, and I was there holding him down while he shrieked in horror with all these wires coming out from his chest as they did these tests. He couldn't understand. He couldn't understand that I was loving him through that moment. And all I could do as a father was I just kept saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I just kept saying that repetitively. Ultimately, the reason that I trust God through something like the coronavirus is not because of philosophy, but because I believe the Christian God came and he suffered with us. I believe that in the person of Jesus, that is God's way of saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And as the words of Jesus himself, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he, he with me. That's the hope that we have, the hope of a beautiful intimacy that can be everlasting. And it's a hope I believe we need to hold on to in this time. Thank you, Vince. For the sake of respecting your time, we're trying to keep our answers brief, but we recognize there is so much more to be said on this topic. If you do want to think more deeply about that particular question, I'd encourage you to pick up Vince and Ravi Zacharias's co-authored book, Why Suffering? Finding Meaning and Comfort When Life Doesn't Make Sense. Or if you want to take a deeper academic dive into this question, then Vince's PhD thesis will be published by Oxford University Press later this year, so you can pick that up as well. Now, Abdi, I think we only need to go online or look at the empty shelves in the supermarkets to see just how high the level of panic has been around what, what we're dealing with at the moment. And I think particularly within uh, faith communities, there's one question that keeps coming up over and over again, and it's the one that's actually been asked by Lydia this evening, um, which I'm going to put to you now. It's, is, is it really the last days? Because I'm terrified if I'm not ready. Mm. Well, I can appreciate the question, Lydia, and my guess is it's been asked by a lot of folks um, over the course of the, the, the time here, and probably even in response to uh, this event we're having now, where people are asking, given what we're seeing, the unprecedented nature of these things, and we're using words like unprecedented, or indefinite, or we're looking at these images of the empty shelves. Um, someone I know just saw someone get into a fist fight over at a grocery store with another person over a parcel of groceries. And it's like, my goodness, we're devolving, it seems, and this is exactly what it seems like the, the, the Bible describes as the end days. The reason why this is a very natural thing to actually ask is because we're constantly asking it. Things are unprecedented in some ways, and they're historical. But for a moment, just take a second back and think to yourself, a lot of things were unprecedented and historical and never before seen in, in mass ways. The plague. The people thought the plague was the, the last days as well. They thought that, well, it's hurting and killing so many people. This, surely this is, these are the, this is the end times. When Halley's Comet first came and they, when, when, they, when they first really saw it and could predict it, they thought this was a portent of the last days. I remember, I wasn't even a Christian yet. I was actually investigating faith. I came from a Muslim background and I was investigating faith uh, in Christianity and I found the evidence to be so compelling at some point where it was intellectually just in my mind so powerfully. But then, this is around 1999, and then the Y2K bug thing was happening. Uh, those of you who might be too young to remember this, uh, in the year 1999, we were all terrified that the world was going to end because all of our computers saved dates by the last two digits. So 1999 would be categorized in the computer as 99. And so everyone was nervous that when the year 2000 flipped, that our computers would take us back to the beginning of the century and banks would stop working and our cars would stop working and computers would go haywire and one world government would come in and try to save the day and everything would be ruined and Satan would come and take over and all these kind of things. Well, this conversation was so powerful and so loud at the time that it actually blocked my view of the gospel. I was finding the evidence for faith so strong. And the reason why is because back then, there was, we were using this as a, a way to think about geopolitical issues, whether it was you know, the Arabs in, is, in Israel and other things, and is the end times gonna be factored around that? And I, as an Arab person, thought to myself, my goodness, Christians are so concerned 
with who's right and who's wrong and whose DNA is the right DNA that I lost sight of the gospel and the whole thing. And it delayed my coming to faith. Now, it happened to be that in the year 2000 is when I came to faith after the Y2K bug thing. And it wasn't because I was afraid of Y2K. It's because I was distracted by Y2K. Hmm. Now, what I would suggest to you is this. We should be living in a way in hope, but also in preparedness as if it's the last hour, not just the last day. I mean, Jesus says that we're not gonna be able to figure out or predict the time or the hour of the, of the Son of Man's coming. So we must live in a state of preparedness. And that doesn't mean like a prepper kind of a way where we hoard the, the supplies and we batten down the hatches and we prepare for war. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spiritual preparedness. And I think that's your question, Lydia, is that you're asking about being ready spiritually for the return of Jesus. This is not just a believer's question. Mm. A lot of folks who are religiously minded ask this question all the time where they're thinking, okay, I believe in God in some form of fashion and things seem like they're ending or they're going haywire or I've seen one too many zombie horror movies and this is exactly how it plays out. It starts off small and ends up big and all these things. So people, not just Christians or religiously minded people, but people who have big questions are asking this. And so Lydia, your question is so apt because you talk about the idea of being ready. What does it mean to be ready? It's actually quite simple. It's easy. One, don't get distracted with the things around us. Take them seriously. It's a very serious time where we have to care for one another in very careful, thoughtful ways. But at the same time, remember something. Being spiritually prepared for the end times in the Christian worldview is not about making sure you've done enough good things and you've been pietistic enough and you've put enough you know, capital in your spiritual bank account where you can please God in the end and you, when he comes, he can say, I found you to be someone who's merited my favor. That's not what the Christian worldview is about because none of us can merit God's favor. Now that might sound superficially troubling, but I can guarantee you, if you look at the Bible, it's only superficially troubling the idea that you haven't done enough good things to please God, because the reality is none of us have. And the reason why it's superficial is because the Bible says you cannot do enough things to please God, which is why he sent his son who lives the perfect life so that we can have his righteousness credited to us. And that when we stand before him, if we've accepted what he's done on the cross for us, paid our debt, and he, and he stands in our place in that seat of judgment, so that we don't have to be judged, that's when hope comes. So you don't have to be terrified that you're not ready. You can be confident that you are ready, not based on your merit. I would be terrified it was based on my merit, but based on his merit. And so whether this is the, these are the last days, or this is the last hour, or by the time this live stream is done, Jesus comes back. You can know right now, I don't care who you are, by the mm -hmm. way, you can know right now that you have confidence that you are ready because you've put your faith in Christ. And you can do that now and not be terrified. Instead, you can be confident even with the coronavirus. Thank you, Abdi. I think maybe people were a little less panicky about the millennium in England because the only thing I remember about it was I was given a, a stuffed animal called Millibug, which represented <laughs> the millennial bug. It was really cute. Anyway. Um, but how old were you at the time? Uh, I was I was younger than Abdi. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there are so many facets to this virus that people are struggling with right now. And um, I think one of them is the loneliness that comes with socially distancing ourselves from, from each other. But I think perhaps perhaps an even deeper level to that is for, for those who actually feel like this has put God at a, at a distance as well. And, and this next question speaks to that from um, Kenster, who writes, in general, I feel very confused and exposed vulnerable. I don't know what will happen and know that being a Christian doesn't exempt me from troubles to come. How does one really pray in these times? Kenster, so I just want to thank you for vocalizing what I think so many millions of people are feeling right now. They're feeling confused and exposed and vulnerable. But I think with so many things that are changing around us right now, there's, there's a fundamental truth that doesn't change. And that is the fact that God is the one through whom and in whom all things hold together. And there's a sense in which the only reason I have the next breath to, to take is because beneath it all, God is sustaining the universe and this planet and my very life. 
life. And that hasn't changed in the slightest. And I think what's going on isn't that we've become more mortal. I just think it's been inescapably and overwhelmingly put in our faces just the fact of how um, vulnerable we, we truly are and always have been, that we are mortal, that, that we do have a finitude to our lives. And that's something that typically we can live in denial of because in our culture, we've sanitized these things. You know, we push away sickness, we push away the dying, even corpses are removed from us. I think it's Aldo Huxley who made the comment that for most people, we live as if death were merely an unfounded rumor and suddenly we can't escape from that anymore. And, and I wonder if the reason people are feeling panicky Maybe it exposes the fact that actually, perhaps if you're struggling to trust in God in this season, it, it, it might expose that maybe it wasn't so much God that you were trusting in before, but, but the safety of your circumstances. And so perhaps the place to start when we're wondering how to pray is just to acknowledge, actually, yes, we're not in control. We are so far out of control, but you know what? We actually never were. We never were in control. God is, however. And there are, there are words that I find extremely comforting that Jesus spoke actually on the way to his death to his disciples when he said, in this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And when I think about that, it, it, it encourages me it, in how I want to pray because that is spoken by a God who is personal, a God who's not disengaged or removed from our suffering, but who came that close to be with us in it, which means when we're talking to God in this time, when we're praying, we don't need to try and get his attention. Everybody else may be distanced from you, but God has not socially distanced himself from you. He is right there. The Bible speaks of God as being very close to the brokenhearted in particular. And so that means we can speak to him in a personal way. That means if you are angry, you can tell him. That means if you're scared, you can let it out. If you are despairing, you can cry about that to God. That's the kind of authentic relationship that he wants with you. But it also means that because Jesus has overcome the world, we can approach prayer from an eternal perspective that actually no matter what this life may throw at us, no matter what we endure in life or death in this world, that actually the Bible speaks of eternity as being set in the hearts of humankind. The truth is you are made for so much more than anything that this world could contain or throw at you. Mm. And so when, when we're struggling with these things, there's a security that comes from knowing that actually there is an eternal God, that we are made to be eternal as well. And that is a truth that also cannot be shaken here. And it makes me think of the words of our dearly beloved colleague, Nabil Qureshi, who a few years ago uh, was diagnosed with terminal um, stage four stomach cancer. And, and he died a couple of years ago. And I remember him saying that actually what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means, the very act that overcomes the world, what that means is that if you come to a point in your life when there is no hope, well, death is not the end. There is more. There is hope no matter what. And yet from that place of security, that doesn't mean that we can't ask God for things now. And I think this is so crucial when it comes to the way that, that we are asked to pray. I think sometimes as Christians, we can be so nervous about asking God for things and not getting the answer that we want, that we kind of perform these calculations in our head where we first try to work out what will God say yes to and what will he say no to before we dare to ask him anything. But again, I think that's an example of us trying to stay in control uh, because we're already deciding for God what what he wants to do rather than bringing it to him and letting him be God and do what he will do. And when we read the New Testament, Jesus calls us to pray audaciously and boldly. He says, if you ask for anything in my name, I will give it to you. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. And he tells the story of a persistent widow who goes and knocks on a judge's house on his door night after night at midnight, begging him for justice and says, that's how you would approach prayer with that kind of persistence. Because if even an angry, unfair judge is eventually gonna roll over and respond, how much more would a just and loving judge who is God? So I want to encourage you, take your request to God. Ask him for healing. Ask him to provide for your daily needs. Why? Because he's a good God who loves to give good gifts to his children. So in this season where we may feel quite isolated, I just want to encourage you, it's Lent, during Lent, to press further into God, to see this as a time when you can lean in to prayer, to getting close to him. And if you're someone who's watching and actually you haven't prayed for a really long time, or maybe you've never prayed 
Don't be afraid of prayer. Actually, God welcomes your prayers. I think he would love to hear from you. You don't need to worry about what to say. Just come to him honestly where you are. Mm -hmm. And, And our prayer is that you would encounter a God who is profoundly close to you during this season. But I know that for some of us, actually, the suffering that you've been enduring, whether it's to do with what you're going through at the moment or whether it has been other sufferings in your life, actually, they've been so profound um, that you may feel like, I don't forget about prayer. I don't even know if I can keep going. I don't know if I can carry on. And that is what our next question expresses. Um, So we have a really vulnerable question here from Logu, who's asked Vince, in light of the suffering in this world, is suicide the easy way out? Yeah, thank you, Logu, for um, asking such a, a vulnerable question and a question that many people are asking, I'm sure, um, around the world. And uh, I'm not a licensed healthcare professional. Nothing that um, I can say should in any way be substituted for the advice of a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a, a mental health expert. Um, please hear me say that. But this is a question that we receive in one form or another at almost every open forum that we do now. We are dealing with a mental health crisis in America and in many other places as well. And it's also a question that hits home for us as a ministry because the whole story of the beginning of this ministry starts on a bed of suicide with Ravi, our founder, as a teenager, having tried to take his life and being on a bed of suicide and someone coming in and giving a Bible and a passage being read from John chapter 14 to Ravi, and it's saying that because I live, because Jesus lives, you too shall live. And that was the moment of a turning point in Ravi's life from a bed of suicide to this ministry and the team that surrounds him and a life of true meaningfulness and true purpose. So if you are even in that place where you're on that bed of suicide right now, I want you to know that that's possible. I want you to know that just a word spoken by the God who loves you that deeply, the God who truly lives and therefore is the author of life and therefore can give you life, uh, more is possible and there is more in your future as well. You know, for those who are feeling the brokenness of this world very, very deeply, Uh, The Christian faith affirms that. It says that we live in a fallen world. It says that you should feel that brokenness. And sometimes it helps us to make sense of some of the mental challenges that we have. Think of just one example, um, separation anxiety. One form of anxiety where we're anxious about separation from either home or from people that we have a strong emotional attachment to. Well, the Christian faith and Christian theology, it makes some sense of that because the Bible tells me that I'm not home. The Bible tells me that I'm a foreigner, that I'm an exile, that my primary citizenship is in heaven. And the Bible also tells me that I am separated from the relationship that should mean most to me, from the relationship with my creator. And so it makes some sense of that. Sometimes theology can help us to explain some of the challenges that we deal with in the context of mental health. Oftentimes what is said is that we are over-exaggerating or overestimating the fear that we have. The fear that we have overestimates or it exaggerates the reality of the circumstances that we're dealing with. And sometimes that's true. I mean, if you have an irrational fear of spiders and there are no spiders in the vicinity, then great, let's talk about that, let's fact check that, let's get some different habits of reasoning going and let's see if we can deal with that. But I wonder if sometimes that's not always the case. You know, what are we supposed to do when our fears are not exaggerated? What are we supposed to do when we fear the coronavirus? What are we supposed to do when we fear that the relationships that mean the most to us won't last? What are we supposed to do when we fear suffering and loneliness and death? What are we supposed to do when our fears are not exaggerated, when our fears are grounded very clearly in the reality of our broken world? And I wonder if maybe the problem is not so much that we have overestimated our fears, but that we have underestimated the possibility of them being overcome. If God exists, could it be that through the eternal perspective that he can give us and through the eternal destiny that he can give us, that we could have that sense of home that we long for. If God exists, could it be that through the consistency and constancy of relationship with him, that could help us with some of the separation and some of the loneliness that we feel? 
Could it be that, that fear of being out of control, the root fear of a fear of spiders, could it be that that fear of being out of control gets alleviated by the fact that actually we know there's a God who in a deep sense is in ultimate control? You know, this other part of your question here is suicide the easy way out. I would, I would caution against the word easy there with respect to suicide because for many people that's an excruciating choice and an excruciating um, experience. But this, this phrase, the easy way out, it did um, catch my eye as we think about the pandemic that we're in currently. Because in the Antonine and Cyprian plagues of the second and third centuries, when people were literally running for the hills to flee from a pandemic, many of the Christians stayed in the cities to care for the sick and the dying. Rodney Stark says that statistically you were more likely to survive if you had a Christian as a neighbor. And that's one of the main reasons that Christianity grew in the first few centuries. Then you go to the fourth century and you get the emperor Julian talking about how he can't squash Christianity. Why? Because they care not only for their own poor, but they care for our poor as well, even the non-Christian poor. And it continues on. You go to the 16th century, 1527. We had a plague in Wittenberg, Martin Luther. Classes were moved. The university was moved. He stayed and he turned his house into a hospital. And you think of the Ebola medical uh, missionaries in 2014, they were Time's person of the year because of the way they responded. Now, I know that that's a high calling, and that's not an easy calling, that's a difficult calling. And you may feel, especially if you're in this place where you're thinking about things like depression and anxiety and suicide, you might think that God can't use me for a high calling like that. Does he know the scars that I have? Does he know the shame that I'm living with, what I would want to say is that God can and desires to use you specifically now and specifically because of the suffering and the brokenness that you have felt so deeply. You know, when Thomas had doubts about uh, Jesus and he said, I need to see the nail wounds. I need to put my finger there. I need to put my hand in his side. Jesus showed up and he said, take your finger and put it here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Jesus had scars and he kept those scars and he was scarred for us and he even offered for Thomas to be there vulnerably with him and to touch his scars. And so if you're approaching this whole season with scars, with shame, with depression, with difficulty, that does not discount you from God's plans, far from it. In fact, Jesus convinced Thomas that he was willing to share his scars with Thomas and maybe Thomas then knew that he could share his scars with Jesus. And I heard recently of a woman who had a long history of uh, cutting herself. And this was specifically the story that spoke to her. If Jesus had scars and if he kept his scars, and even though I have scars, God can still use me. And she said, I know now, this was after she had put her trust in Jesus. She said, I know now that my scars likely will not disappear, but I have hope that one day they will bear the glory of the one who was scarred for me. I think it's particularly in this time when people are suffering that you are going to be able to come alongside people and say, I've been there. I've felt what you have felt. I've known that fear. I've known that depression. I have those scars and I will walk with you. I will show my scars to you and you can show your scars to me and we can walk through this together. I think God has a particular plan for your life and I think it may be particularly in this season that that plan becomes more clear. As Vince has mentioned, mental health challenges are extremely difficult to deal with and they often require treatment and medication and support. So if you are struggling currently with suicidal thoughts, then please don't suffer alone. If you're here in the US, please do reach out to the National Suicide Helpline. And if you're elsewhere in the world, then you'll see a link on your screens, which, which will take you to hopefully local resources where you can get help as well. Um, it's certainly a comforting thought to believe that even in our darkest moments, there might be someone who is there, a God who's there to help us with it. But I think for many, that is the question, isn't it? Is there a God who is there to help us? And is there any evidence to believe that? So Abdi, we're coming to you as a lawyer who's used to weighing evidence. I'm going to combine two questions actually around, around this same issue of, of what evidence do we have? One is from a college student who asks, does a vast giant universe disprove God? Mm -hmm. And then the second one comes from someone called Isaiah who wants to know, is there any evidence for God outside of the Bible? And how can we know if this evidence is credible? Mm. 
That's, that's great questions, and they are related. Um, uh, the second one actually has some aspects, not just, I think, of science, but also of history, because mm -hmm. one of the things we ask about is, there, is there evidence outside the Bible for Jesus, not only his existence, but what he did? Uh, and the answer to that question, both from a scientific perspective about God's existence and from a historical perspective about Jesus not only existing, but doing the things that the Bible said he did, is yes, there's excellent uh, evidence outside of that. So I'm going to answer that part first, and then come to the second part. So Isaiah, I'm going to answer your part first. Um, and the evidence that I, I saw, actually, this is something that I was challenging Christians on um, early on in my search. You know, it took nine years for me to become a Christian uh, from sort of bang to bullets. When I started um, to uh, investigate the faith, originally to knock it out, to basically say this is not worth believing and to challenge Christians as to why they believe what they believed and then show them that what I believed was actually true. Um, and I began to see some what uh, Al Gore would call inconvenient truths, uh, which is that there's plenty of evidence outside the Bible to not only believe that Jesus existed, but that he did what he said he did, and the Bible says he did. Now, I was a Muslim, so I believed in Jesus as a prophet, as someone who performed miracles, was born of a virgin, and all these things. So I didn't necessarily need the proof of that, but I wanted to challenge even that belief, because I wanted to believe it was true, not what was tradition. So I began to look and see the, for, the, for the evidence. And what we see is not only that the Bible itself is a reliable source document for the life in, of Jesus. In fact, most scholars will tell you the, the, the synoptic gospels and the gospel of John and the book of Acts um, are the primary source documents we have about what happened uh, in the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. And they're very early sources as well. So I don't want to discount that because when we ask the question about things outside the Bible, the assumption being made is that because the Bible says it, it must therefore be biased. And therefore we need outside evidence to corroborate it. Otherwise, we're really uh, approaching it from a biased witness. So as a lawyer, I can tell you this. Whenever you put a witness on the stand, whenever you put a witness on the stand, there's always a perspective that that witness has. And that would, might, might seem to be bias, and you have ways of testing that through cross-examination, through verification, through corroboration. You want to find out if the witness is biased. But you don't assume the bias unless it's proven through extrinsic means. So what you need to do is find evidence outside the witness's testimony to find out if the witness is, is biased. So with the Bible, you don't approach the New Testament and say, I assume it's biased until proven otherwise. You assume it's not biased unless it's proven to be biased. I'll give you an example of this. If you were to take Holocaust survivors and ask them for their testimonies about what they went through in the death camps or what they went through in various concentration camps or when they were hidden uh, by Christians or by others in the homes when the Nazis were coming for them, and you were to take their accounts and you were to hear the emotion-laden accounts and you were to see the tears, you were to see the trembling in the hands, would you assume they're biased? Well, they have an agenda, don't they? Well, of course they have an agenda. Maybe that agenda is to tell the truth based on the horrors that they actually faced. So you would automatically not assume that they were biased. You would see the emotion there, but you wouldn't question the veracity of their testimony unless there's reason to. I think the same thing is true of the Bible. Just because the eyewitnesses put their accounts into an orderly fashion for us to read doesn't mean that they're biased. It means that they may have recorded it the way it was supposed to be, that way. And you do see corroborating evidence outside the Bible for the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, or at least the claims of that. So much so when you have Josephus, a Jewish historian, when you have Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian, when you have uh, 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 Pliny and you have other uh, historians outside who are hostile to the Christian faith, who are actually telling us that Christians not only claimed that Jesus died on the cross, but they were willing to die for the, f for the fact that they ascribed to Jesus as having risen from the dead. And that evidence is really strong. Evidence that I didn't want to be strong, but I found to be compelling enough to put my faith in Christ as someone who died on the cross and then rose from the dead to prove that when he died, he paid my debt. Because if he died and stayed dead, there's no reason to believe him. But if he died and rose, there's every reason to believe only him. And he says that about me, that I'm made in God's image and I'm worth dying for. And he did in fact do that. And I believe him because he rose from the dead. Guys who rise from the dead, they tend to have credibility. And that worked <laughs> in this instance as well for me to see that he had credibility. And the extra evidence outside the Bible from the Roman historians, from the Jewish historians, from those who were hostile to Christianity, at least admitting some very important facts, help me there. But this is one small facet of the gospel narrative. Um, it's the chief facet, but if you were to look at the existence of God 
and all the evidence that mounts there, I think it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Time doesn't allow me to go into all of it, but let me just suggest a couple of things here, is that when we look at the way the universe is constructed, and we look at just, just our, our solar system, for example, our solar system, our planet happens to be in what's called the Goldilocks zone. It's just right for life. Mm -hmm. We're not too close to the sun, otherwise it'd be too hot and life couldn't form or wouldn't even be able to exist. Nor, neither are we too far from the sun because it would be too cold and life wouldn't be able to exist because the liquid water wouldn't be as abundant, it would be frozen water, the bacteria wouldn't be able to interact the way they interact, life wouldn't be able to sustain and consume resources and reproduce and all these things. Our planet is exactly where it needs to be. Now, why is that? Because of the balancing act that's happening. When you look at our solar system and you see a gas giant the size of Jupiter, that planet pulls on us through gravitation. That planet pulls on us. So it pulls us just far enough away from our sun so we're not too close. But it's not big enough to pull us further away from our sun than we need to be so that we're not too far. We're exactly where we need to be in our solar system so that life can exist on this planet. Plus, that gas giant with its massive gravitation pulls in large debris from around the solar system and things that orbit us all the time big rocks, asteroids, meteorites, these kind of things that would smash into our Earth and destroy all life here. Yet the cosmic vacuum cleaner that I believe God has placed at just the right distance from our planet prevents extinction of life and allows us to live on this planet. That's just two facets, our distance from the sun and the existence of Jupiter. That's just two facets. Then you take into account the idea of the moon, the fact that the moon, our moon, our satellite, we only have one and it's abnormally large compared to its, to its main planet. Our moon, though small, is actually large compared to the body that it orbits. That allows for tides and for other gravitational issues that allow for life to exist and perpetuate on this planet. And it just so happens to be that our moon is the exact right size. Now, all this is telling me that the universe is engaged in a, in a, in a celestial dance. It really is. There is an amazing amount, and this is just, there's so many more things to tell you about but it's all engaged in a celestial dance. And our planets are far enough away from each other based on other facets of the universe. So for example, if I were to look at where our solar system actually is in our galaxy, you know, the, the Milky Way is a spiral armed galaxy. And we don't live inside a spiral arm, one of the big milky spiral arms. We don't live inside of that. We live in one of the dark spots in between the spiral arms. We're not too close to the center, otherwise we'd be destroyed, nor are we too far away. We live exactly where we need to live so that we can actually have a maximum view of the visible universe. That's remarkable because what are the odds that the only planet that has observers on it like us happens to be in the prime spot to observe things? It looks like, to quote, I think it was uh, uh, Hoyle, um, who said, someone's been monkeying with the physics. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're placed exactly where we need to be. Now, this goes back to the original question then. Does a vast universe disprove God? I go back to the end of the movie Contact. If you've seen this movie, it's basically, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the film version of a novel written by Carl Sagan, the, the agnostic. Carl Sagan was a scientist, and he always wrestled with matters of faith and science. He always wrestled with these issues, and I think in profound ways. And in the, the book, he has this character who's basically a surrogate for himself, uh, Ellie Arroway. She's sort of a dyed-in-the-wool atheist, a skeptic, but she has an encounter with aliens, essentially, that she can't prove actually happened. And so people have to take her testimony on faith. Well, at the end of the story, she's, she's back from her encounter, and she's giving a tour of the very large array of these satellite dishes that are trying to find extraterrestrial life. And she's giving a tour to these young kids. And the young kid asks her the question, the same exact question that's asked here. Um, uh, essentially, the kid asks, is there a life out there? And she says to him, well, what do you think? And he says, I don't know. And she likes that. She's like, oh, good, you're a skeptic. I like that. And she says, I'll tell you what, though. The universe is bigger than anything anyone's ever imagined. So if it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. I remember thinking that's superficially, you know, sort of uplifting, but it's actually a little bit on the shallow side. Why would it be a waste of space? You see, when we think of evidence and we think of the universe and science and history, we tend to put God into this sort of very efficient box. Like if God exists, he would be an engineer who wouldn't waste space, who wouldn't do things extravagantly. He would do things exactly as efficiently as they need to be. Why would that be the case? 
why would it be the case that a vast universe makes us insignificant and therefore means that this is all part of a big cosmic accident that didn't have us in mind? Or could it be the fact that this little pale blue dot exists as a, as a seemingly insignificant part of a vast universe that happens to have a gas giant and a yellow sun and other galaxies and other bodies within the universe pulling and pushing in a way that makes life on this universe, uh, sorry, on this planet possible so that we can look at the celestial heavens, this vast universe, and see that God is not just an engineer, he is also an artist who paints with a brush that is so extravagant because he wants us to discover the universe he created. The Bible specifically says in Proverbs 25 verse two, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, not so that we never find it, because it is the glory of kings to seek things out. Maybe the vast universe doesn't disprove God's existence. Maybe the vast universe proves God's generosity. Hmm. I'm glad you never had me on the stand. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to Audi talk about science for hours. He's so passionate about it. I love it. I think Vince and I are having a Goldilocks moment in these chairs. They fit perfectly, but you're slightly uncomfortably perched <laughs> on the edge. We'll get you a bigger seat next time. Um, but if you want to intellectually explore the evidence for Christianity, then might I recommend to you Abdu's brand new podcast, which has just come out, which is called The Defense Rests. And in it, he'll be examining the evidence for and against the Christian faith. Uh, from a legal perspective. So we do invite you to check that out. Now, the next question is actually from someone who isn't wrestling with the evidence for the existence of God, but actually they're more struggling with the character of God and particularly how he sees them. And uh, this is a question from Susan who asks, I'm a Christian, but I have some feminist leanings, which makes it hard to understand what my role should look like as a woman per the Bible. What does it mean to obey God while also desiring to be valued as a woman? Mm. And Susan, I'm so glad that you asked this question. It's one that's very dear to my heart. I, I wrestled with this for so many years that actually I wound up uh, doing my PhD research in an area related to this question precisely because I really wanted to understand how does God see women and what does the Bible have to say about it? And I, I think I think this is really good the way you phrase the question because there's something very hard about it's hard to be comfortable in a relationship with somebody if you if you feel insecure about how they see you and, and whether they value you or if they value other people more than they value you. And, and especially that idea of trusting somebody in a way where you would obey them is difficult if you're not confident that actually they have your best in mind. And so I, I think you're asking the right question here. I can remember as a teenager reading uh, The Great Gatsby for the first time and the words of Daisy Buchanan just lodged in my mind. She says this about her daughter. I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. And I remember reading those words and thinking, oh, is, is that what the Bible has to say about me too, that I should be seen and not heard, that I'm ornamental and decorative, but, but really uh, uh, didn't have much to contribute, not much meaning or purpose in the world. But, but to my uh, delight, as I dug into scripture, particularly over years of studying it, I actually came to find the complete opposite was true to the rumors that I've been hearing about how God sees women in the Bible. And actually, we don't even have to go very far. If we start on the very first chapter in Genesis chapter one, we read that God made humankind in his image, male and female, he created them. And it's fascinating to me that it didn't need to spell that out. You know, it could have just said it made man in his image, but someone was very, being very particular about the fact when we talk about these unique beings equally and significantly made to image God, to represent him, we're talking about male and female. Now, the importance of that may not strike you from our 21st century perspective, but contrast it with other ancient worldviews like that of Plato in the fifth century BC, who, who commented that actually it's only males who are created directly by the gods and are given souls and that those who live rightly return to the stars but those who are cowards may with reason be supposed to have changed into the nature of women in the second generation. Sorry, ladies, it's not very flattering. Um, but, but when you contrast that with what the Bible is saying, it's absolutely radical. And, and it makes me so sad when, when I meet feminists who will tell me I'm, I'm too feminist actually to believe the Bible because I think what other ground do you have to stand on? You know, if you look at naturalism and survival of the fittest, that, 
that goes by might makes right and every man for himself. And where's equal value in that? Whereas with Christianity right at the beginning, you're given a foundation to stand upon as a woman that God says, actually, you have an innate worth that can never be taken away from you. And that kind of valuing runs all the way through the Bible. Now, it's certainly true in the Old Testament. We read a lot of horrendous stories and we see women treated in some really appalling ways. But actually, the reason for that is because the Bible doesn't shy away from telling a a true story about both the extreme highs and lows of human behavior. And in that sense, I'm actually grateful for what we find there because it means we can't accuse the Bible of holding some kind of religious cover-up or trying trying to disguise the way that people have been mistreated. Actually, it lays it all bare in a very clear way, I think, for us to learn from so that we don't go and do likewise, but also because we consistently see throughout Scripture God protecting, often through legal codes, sometimes through direct intervention, the very women who who the men within their culture are taking advantage of and abusing. And not only does he provide justice for those women, but actually he, he sometimes even uses women to enable justice. And if you're thinking about what roles you could have according to the Bible as a woman, I find it remarkable that 3,000 years before the first um, U.S. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed, uh, the first woman to that position, 3,000 years earlier, Deborah was appointed as judge of all Israel, both as a military leader uh, presiding over a court where people would come to her to make legal decisions. And then she ruled over the nation of Israel for a long time as a very successful ruler, bringing peace to the land. Throughout the Bible, we see women who are are risking their, their lives to save other people's lives, and they're celebrated for it. We see women who are praised for their entrepreneurial savvy and their creative financial um, ingenuity. We see uh, women who are put in positions of great influence in order to be able to save a nation. And we see women who are anointed by God to speak as prophets uh, on his behalf to kings. So we see women in remarkable positions. And that only carries on in the New Testament as well. You don't really see Jesus interacting with a woman in a single occasion where he isn't dramatically overturning the culture of that time in the way that he treats them. And that carries on in the early church as well. For example, the teaching on marriage in Christianity when But Paul makes this radical statement in the New Testament that actually not only does a wife's body belong to her husband, but a husband's body belongs uh, to his wife. Or, you know, often people get offended by the statement that a wife should submit to her husband, which in our culture today, the language of that is is troublesome for us. But we overlook the context of that text when actually the really radical thing that Paul is saying is that husbands should love their wives to such a, a, a sacrificial degree that like Jesus Christ, they're willing to lay down their lives for her day in and day out. So time and again, we see this amazing vision, a transformative, radical vision for the position and the value of women within Christianity. Even Paul, when he's writing to women, he calls them his co-workers in the early church. There's Lydia, who hosts the house church. Um, We know the four unmarried daughters of Philip who are prophesying. There's Phoebe, who's a deacon, junior, who's praised as being outstanding among the apostles. Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife teaching team. We see women fulfilling all kinds of roles, even within the New Testament church. So when I read these scriptures, far from being discouraged or disheartened, I'm so amazed. I think if you're a woman and you're looking for a worldview that values women, this is the one for you. Not only does it have a perspective on valuing women, but it gives you a foundation for that. I don't think you will find in any other worldview. When I look at Jesus Christ, I see exactly the kind of man I want to spend time with and exactly the kind of God that it is honestly a joy and privilege to worship. And if you're wondering as a woman about Christianity tonight, then really it is an honor to commend it to you this evening. Mm -hmm. I just find it so encouraging listening to you both speak because so many people might think science disproves God. And you didn't respond to that from a defensive standpoint, but said, no, actually, if you understand it correctly, only God proves science. Mm -hmm. And so many people think that I couldn't possibly be a Christian or take Jesus seriously because of what I believe about the value of women. And you're saying, no, if you believe that women are valued, Jesus is exactly the person to go to. So I just appreciate mm-hmm. both the answers yep. you've given. Mm. Well, it's definitely mm. what we both found to be true. Indeed. And, um, but I think for some people, Vince, it's not so much that they're looking to God for value, but actually they'd say, well, I find my value in, in, in the relationships that I have with other people. And so I, I really appreciate this question that's coming from a high school student who says, what if my happiness relies not on God? but on another human? 
Well, first, I just want to say uh, I'm glad you're happy. I, I think that's a, that's a great thing, and, yeah. and I think that's a gift from God. That. I think that's a gift from God. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I'd also want to say with, with C.S. Lewis that if, you know, if happiness were all we were after, then, uh, as he said, a good bottle of port would do the trick. Um, his point was, uh, if happiness is a good thing in life, maybe it's not the only good thing. And, and I wonder if implicit in your question is something of this assumption that happiness is the ultimate a goal. Uh, 51% of, of Generation Z say that 51, uh, that happiness is our ultimate goal in life. And, and I'd want to question that. Um, 1974, a philosopher named Robert Nochick, he uh, put a thought experiment forward. He called it the experience machine. And the idea was that you could uh, plug into this machine and it would give you an exact similarity, an exact sameness the exact mental states of any experience that you wanted to have. So you wanted the experience of winning the Olympics, you know, you could have that. You wanted the experience of being as good looking as Abdu, you know, you could, you could have that. You could have exactly the experiences that you want. And then he asked a question of people. He said, would you plug into the machine? And it's an interesting question. He, sh- he said that we shouldn't plug into the machine. He said, because I don't just want to feel as if I'm loved. I actually want to be loved. Uh, I don't just want to feel like I've made a difference. I want to actually make a difference. These things are important. And he said, no, I don't think we should plug into the experience machine. He said, there's more to life than just those feelings of happiness that we desire. We want them to be grounded in reality. And I remember listening to a radio program. I wasn't even listening to it to listen to Ravi, but I happened to be listening to the radio and Ravi came on and he was being interviewed. And the interviewer asked him the question, do you enjoy your ministry? And we've been up front with Ravi mm-hmm. so many times, you know, and there, it's hard to find a version of a question that he hasn't heard mm-hmm. and that he doesn't know something significant of how he wants to respond. I've never seen him actually sit back and pause for the length of time that he did before he responded to that question. And when he finally responded, he said, there have been many moments of deep joy And what I realized was that he had never thought about his ministry or his life in that framework, in those terms. He had never primarily thought to himself, is this what makes me happiest? Is this what is most enjoyable? Is this what is most pleasurable? He asked also deeper questions about calling and character and service and love and about the way that he wanted to treat people and about the purpose and the meaning that God had in his life. And I think that's very significant. So I would ask you to think deeply about this question of whether happiness is the most significant thing in life. One thing I would say is that if that's what you believe, that's a very exclusive worldview. It's a very exclusive philosophy. Maybe there are a few people in the world who can make things work for a time with that philosophy, but the reality is there's a lot of people in the world who are not happy. And even the people who are happy right now, there's going to come a time when suffering comes, when a pandemic comes, when death comes. All of us are going to face that time when we're not happy. That is a very exclusive philosophy. And I personally want my worldview to be much more inclusive than that. I am attracted to the worldview of Christianity because it is based on the unconditional love of God for every single person and an invitation to every single person in the world to step into an intimate relationship with him. I don't want an exclusive philosophy based on happiness that only some have the privilege of seeking after. I want a totally inclusive philosophy. And the other thing I would say, just as I finish on this question, is I'm so glad that happiness was not the fundamental thing that God was after because he was perfectly happy the way he was before the creation of the universe. He was in the perfect fellowship, the perfect relationship, the perfect pleasure of that perfect relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was there in the Trinity. There was no brokenness. There was no frustrated relationships. There was no tension. He had perfect happiness. And if that was all he was after, he never would have created this universe beautifully like Abdu spoke about. He never would have created me. He never would have invited me into the relationship with him that changed my life. So I'm so glad that that's not uh, ultimately what Jesus was after. And, you know, um, the last part of your question, you, you, you said um, that your happiness relies not on God, but on another human. 
There's part of me that wants to say good instinct there. Um, that happiness maybe in some form does need to rely on another human. Why? Well, because God is infinite. He's transcendent. He's so distant from us. Sometimes we feel that need to rely on a, on a human, someone who can relate to what we've been through, someone who understands what we've been through, someone who we can sit and eat with um, across a table. I think perhaps there's a good intuition there in your question and a good instinct. And I would say that for me, that points though, not to a finite human, not to a fallible human, not to a human that's gonna let you down, not to a human that ultimately is going to suffer and die, but to a human who is perfect to a person who is fully human and fully God who can completely relate to you and one day we will literally sit across the table with him and eat and yet is fully divine and so can satisfy our deepest desires. I think there's a good intuition in your question and I would pursue it where it leads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vince. You just mentioned in your answer the fact that there are relationships within God, (laughs) but I actually think that's a huge stumbling block, right, for a lot of people who are trying to, understand Christianity and Abdu, that's that's the next question that we have here from Elizabeth, who uh, she says, recently I happened to watch a debate about the Trinity and it created so much doubt in my life. Are God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit three persons or personalities? Please explain, if they are only one, why did Jesus say in scripture, I sit at the right hand of God and why did Jesus pray to God? Yeah, yeah, great questions. Uh so funny that you, so you've heard me say this before, and I've, I'll say it again: is that the Trinity is literally my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> um, the the way in which God exists as a triune being is so marvelous to me because it's ex- not only is it explainable to a to to a degree, but it also explains so much as well. And so I love your question, Elizabeth, because one, it gets me to talk about the, my favorite topic, but second, because it allows me to talk about um, I th- and explain God in the way he impacted me so powerfully. Um, Now, I didn't become a Christian uh, after I had sort of embraced the Trinity as a thing I could understand. I did embrace it as true because so many other things about Christianity were true, and I still wrestled with the Trinity quite a bit before I became a Christian. Uh, And then even after I was a Christian, I wrestled with it for a little while. But there were so many other things about Christianity that I found to be true. The reality of the cross, the reality of the resurrection, the historicity of the Bible, the reality of so many things that, that, that spoke to me that I could sort of say, the Bible teaches this, and I'm going to explore this later, but I don't need to know all the answers before I put my faith in Christ. So I think if you're, you're struggling with some level of doubt because of something you heard, maybe it was a debate between a Unitarian or a Muslim and a Christian or whatever it might have been, um, and you're experiencing some doubt on this idea of the Trinity, let me just suggest to you this, that this does not mean that everything needs to come crumbling down now. But conversely, if we understand the Trinity, the fortification for your belief can be so much stronger now because it all coheres. It's not just Jesus dying and rising. It's God the Father sending God the Son to die on a cross and paying a real debt to the Father and then the Holy Spirit quickening these things in our lives so that we can actually embrace him and worship him. He can point to Jesus. It all comes together. Let me explain what I mean. So I always describe the Trinity on three levels. And I'm only going to do two of them uh, in the short time we have. But the first level is this. Is it logically possible for God to exist, to be one God in his nature and three in his persons? Is it logically possible? The next level is, is it biblically warranted? In other words, does the Bible actually describe God as a triune being? And then the third level is, is it theologically necessary? In order for God to be the greatest possible being, which by definition God would be, does he have to be a trinity? And I think the answer is yes to that one. So let me go with one, level one, and then level three. The logical possibility and then the theological necessity. Because I think the Bible is pretty clear that God is a triune being throughout the pages of scripture. And I have a book called Grand Central Question where you can get the, um, uh, a table of where I show this, of scripture references to this. Logical possibility, because your question is about the logical possibility as well. We understand what God actually is in terms of how the Trinity is described. It helps us a lot because we misunderstand words all the time. When you say God is one in three persons, when I use the word person, the first thing that conjures up in your mind is an actual human being, a distinct, separate being. 
Now, I'm not using the word person that way. When I'm using the word person to, to, symbolize, to, to uh, reference in this instance is a state of consciousness, is that God exists as one in his nature and three in his states of consciousness or in his personalities, as your question puts it, or in his minds. He's got three minds, essentially. Now, does that sound like a contradiction? It might at first. You say, well, how can God be one and three? That sounds ridiculous. Well, not if nature, the, the what of something, and personhood, the who of someone, are different concepts. So, suggestion for you, uh, illustration. If I were to pull out my phone and I were to ask you, what is this? It's a nature question. What is the nature of this? And its nature is a non-living object non-living thing. You could point to me and you could say, what is that? That's slightly rude, but you could do it. And it's a legitimate question. What is that? I'm a living object. I'm a living thing. So I have a whatness and the phone has whatness. So we have both have a nature, but you can't go to the phone. Who is that? I mean, I know we call them Siri and Alexa and all these things now, but they don't really have personhood. There's no mind in this machine. There's no relatability to the outside world. There's no aspiration for that which is greater than itself. There's none of that kind of a thing. It's got no mind. So you can't say to the phone, who is that? And if you talk to Siri for too long, she begins to repeat herself. And if you talk to her for a really long time, they take you away eventually, right? So, because it's got no personhood. But you can say of me, who is that? I'm the living thing who is Abdu. I have a personhood. So my whatness is my nature. My who-ness is my personhood. And God exists as one in his whatness. He is one in his nature, divine being. But he has three who-nesses, so to speak, three separate states, three separate consciousnesses. And they are, they are sharing the same nature, but they are eternally separate. Now, that's logically possible because the terms are not... Are not um, uh, the same. They're exclusive terms. Nature and person are two different things. Is it fully understandable? The answer is no. And the reason why is because you don't have three personhoods. You don't have three minds and neither do I. But you know what else is hard to fathom? Eternality. So if a Muslim presents the objection that God is, you know, it's, it's no, it makes no sense for God to be triune because, you know, it's, it's too complicated to understand. Well, a Muslim believes that God is eternal Yet here we are as beings who began. We had a beginning. We don't know what it's like to never begin. So we can conceptually fathom the idea of a beginningless being, but we can't actually comprehend a beginningless being because we began. If we conceive of a God who is just like us in every way, that we are one in our nature and one in our personhood, then maybe our God is too small. Maybe our conception of God isn't big enough. So what I would suggest to you is, if God is truly great and worthy of your and my belief, then he's the kind of God who would not defy logic, and therefore he could be one in his nature and three in his person, but he would transcend understanding. Because if you can wrap up God in your mind, then your God is either made up or he's too small. Mm -hmm. and I don't think God is like that. So I think that it's logically possible for God to exist. I think in order for God to be the truly greatest possible being, he would necessarily be a triune being. Now, once I, someone might say, well, why not just two personalities? Why not, uh, or 17 personalities? Why does it have to be three persons within the, the, the Trinity? For first is foremost is Occam's razor. Occam's razor is the precept that you don't need to multiply um, explanations or a complicated answer beyond what needs to be the, the minimum. And what do you need? for a God to be truly great. You need a God who is personal. Now, God in the Bible is a personal God, and he is a God who relates to the outside world, or he relates. He's a relatable God. He's a God of love. He's a God of judgment. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of all these things. He's inherently a relational being. Here's the problem. If God is one in his nature, just one in his nature, one what, and one in his personhood, he's an undifferentiated personhood, then here's the problem. When there was no other beings other than God, then who was he relating to before he created us and the angels and all these things? He needed to create something outside of himself in order to be a relatable or a relational being. Because you don't just love in a vacuum. You have to love someone or something. You have to be merciful and compassionate to someone or something. So God would have to have created something outside of himself to be a relational being. The problem with that is if God needs something outside of himself, then he can't be fully great. 
But the Trinity solves the problem. It doesn't create a problem, it solves it beautifully because God doesn't need anything outside of himself to be a relational being. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father and the Son. And on it goes in eternity in the community of the Trinity. He never lacks relationship, he defines relationship. And therefore, he is a great God. Why three? Because three is the minimum you need for the three kinds of relationships we have. We have self-directed relationship, we have others-directed relationship, and then we have communal relationship. And the least amount of people you need for all three is three. And God exists as one in nature and three in his persons. And so he creates you and me, not because he needs relationship, because he offers you and I the chance to have relationship with him. He is not greater because he creates you. He is loving and his abundant love shows from the Trinity that is the foundation of love to you as a creation who is the very sort of embodiment of what it means to be a God who just loves selflessly. But it also makes sense of the Christian worldview. You know, I remember objecting as a, Christ, as a Muslim to Christianity saying that um, Jesus pays the price on the cross and that seems like a fiction. Like God's really, he's putting money from his right pocket into his left pocket. Mm -hmm. If Jesus is God and he pays the price uh, on the cross, who's he paying it to himself? That's not really a payment at all. Mm -hmm. See how the Trinity solves the problem? Because God is one in his nature, but three in his personhoods. That the Father is a distinct personhood from the Son, even though they share the same nature. So the Father sends the Son, but the Son makes a real actual transaction, a real payment to the Father on your and my behalf. And so the cross isn't a fiction. The cross is real because a real payment by a real person is given to a real person who is God the Father. And then God the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and reminds us, convinces us of our sin and compels us to see the beauty of the payment that was made. I would suggest to you, Elizabeth, that it's not a matter of the Trinity being so complex that it causes doubt is that it's so beautiful that I would hope for you that it causes a robustness in your faith that maybe you didn't see before, but now you can have because not only does God make sense in his grandeur, but God makes sense in what he's done for you and for me. Thank you, Abdi. Um, one of the things you talked about is how the Bible is used as a source for a Christian teaching, like the way we think about the Trinity. Mm. Um, but I think for a lot of people, that's just really problematic because the Bible is such an ancient text um, that how can it have any relevance for us today? And that's the question another high schooler has sent in just now. And um, said, how does the Bible actually describe reality if our world is so different today? For example, in regards to technology, which you mentioned, or uh, beauty standards. Um, and I really appreciate this question because I think we can see the obvious differences here, can't we? I mean, back in the day, you know, you're, you're riding around on your dog you or your camel just trying to eke out a living and survive and while that's actually still true in a lot of parts of the world that people are still struggling in those ways certainly for us in the west we're on the verge of having self-driving cars and uh, so many of us are so comfortable in the way that we live that actually we're drowning in devices until actually our bigger problem is we're weary of pleasure and we're bored of entertainment because we've been entertaining ourselves to death in, in a way mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what, if you look at beauty for example then you know again in, in a more ancient culture actually beauty is just about um, having a, being fed enough to survive so that you can bear children. <laughs> That's the standard of beauty and uh, having access to water so you can wash. Again, I remember having a conversation when I lived in Uganda for seven months with the girls in the village there. And for them, this, this was a nonsensical question and idea of beauty in the West, because for them, it was about, could you just get clean? That was what was considered attractive. But that's so different, again, from our culture here in the West today, where it's all about, um, you know, if you don't like something about yourself, all, all the world over, actually, you can actually, um, you know, have surgery just to change that thing about you. And rather than fattening up to be healthy and bear children, actually, we don't eat so that we can live up to a sort of imposed cultural standard that we need to look like people who walk down catwalks. So you can see where you might wonder, how, how does the Bible relate to us and the issues we're struggling with as people today? And, but what I want to say here is actually, I think that beneath the, the changes in the way that our world may work, actually, there's a timeless truth that the Bible identifies and speaks to better than anything 
anything else can about what's going on within human nature and the needs that we truly have. So for example, um, for those of us who are constantly pursuing the next technological advancement so that we can show how impressive and successful and fantastic we are, you only need to read the story in Genesis 11 of the Tower of Babel to see what happens when people get obsessed about making a name for themselves. Um, I, I, because it still holds true today, I think, that pride does come before a fall, that actually mm. pride can be so destructive. That's a truth the Bible speaks to. Or if you're someone who's just weary with just drowning in entertainment and pleasure and finding life kind of purposeless, well, actually, that's something that is written about in the book of Ecclesiastes, where a king who, who's writing it and has also tried everything is saying, honestly, life and pleasure and all of these things, it just feels like chasing after the wind. It's so empty. And I think what, what the Bible is speaking to there is the sense that actually, no matter what we try out and test and, and pursue in this world, actually, we'll never find satisfaction in those things because we were made for something more. C.S. Lewis would say, actually, the fact we're so dissatisfied, even in our pleasure and entertainment, speaks to the fact that we were made for another world, for something greater. Or think about beauty. It may be that standards of beauty change from culture to culture, but our problems as human beings with beauty remains the same, that, that in cultures the world over, we all objectify one another and see each other as sexual objects rather than people worthy of respect made in the image of God. And that's where Jesus' words in his Sermon on the Mount are so profound. He was in a culture where often women were blamed for leading men astray. And um, it was believed if you, uh, if you found a woman beautiful, then you were in grave danger. As a man, one later Jewish law code even stated, it's actually more dangerous to walk behind a woman than it is to walk behind a lion. And then Jesus, in, in that kind of culture, he speaks these amazing words in his Sermon on the Mount when he says, I tell you that whoever looks at a woman lustfully commits adultery with her in his heart. He's completely flipping the culture on its head and saying, if you're struggling in this area, you can't blame her, but this is a problem you need to take responsibility for. And when I look at those words of Jesus, I think not only is Jesus ahead of his time then, he's ahead of his time, our, our time now. That's how relevant the words of Jesus Christ are. And so I think well, what I want to say to this is actually the Bible diagnoses the real issue of the human condition. It's been said like this, that actually the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. I think that is what the Bible absolutely gets to. When I read scripture, every time it convicts me because it feels like God is holding up a mirror to me and showing me things about myself that I didn't even recognize to be true until I read it there. But then I know, I know deep down that is true of me. But even more than scripture being a mirror, for me, it's a living encounter. When I read the Bible, which I believe is the eternal word of an eternal God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and a God who made me for a relationship with him. Every time I open the Bible and I ask God to speak to me through it, that is a living, relevant, fresh encounter for today. And there are these words in, in the Gospel of John where a lot of people abandon Jesus because he gives some hard teaching and they just find it too challenging mm. to accept and believe. And I think that's how some of us maybe are with the Bible today. We find it hard to understand. And so we put it down and walk away rather than trying to wrestle through to, to make sense of how is it speaking. And then Jesus turns to the few remaining disciples and asks this kind of heartbreaking question, are you going to leave me also? But then Peter responds, to whom else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And I think that is my encounter when I come to scripture, that I find a book that is just filled with life, that when I read the Bible, I encounter a living God, Jesus Christ, who speaks fresh, challenging, beautiful words to me, words that show me a way to live today in the here and now that is better and makes better sense of anything else, any other worldview or way of navigating life or self-help that I've heard. There is life in this book. And so if you're someone who hasn't tried the Bible, who hasn't read it before, I would just recommend to you one thing we all have quite a bit of at the moment is time. So why not take the time to actually try out reading the Bible? Why not read the Gospel of John for yourself and explore it? If, if you don't have a Bible at home and you want to get into it, there's a great app called the Public Reading of Scripture app where actually there's an audio dramatized Bible. You can listen to it if you find that easier. But why not actually examine it for yourself rather than writing it off because it's ancient? Um, God is relevant today. And here's something I believe he really wants to say to you. Joy, I, I love that line you said about how Jesus is not only progressive or forward thinking for his time, but he's actually ahead of us today. Yeah. Uh, I just think I, I would resonate with that because there's so many times when I read the Bible, especially when I take the old and new and juxtapose them together, where I think, my goodness, this book answers objections before they're even raised. Right. Um, and it really uh, inspires me that way. I just love what you had to say <laughs> about that. Yeah, and I, I guess for some, the issue is... Um, 
they feel not only uncertain about the Bible, but uncertain about everything in life. Mm. And um, Vince, I think this is where our next questioner is coming from. This is an ano anonymously been asked, but, but someone, someone says, as an agnostic, I don't understand how you can be confident that there is life after death. Surely it's actually arrogant to claim that you can know that God exists. Well, thank you uh, for this question. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that your starting point is agnosticism. You know, I appreciate that because... There's a lot of people who uh, don't believe that there's evidence for God or for the Christian faith, and they jump really quickly to atheism. Um, now, myself, Joe, Abdu, as he explained, I would really disagree with that claim that there's not evidence for God and evidence for the Christian faith, and that was a, a big part of my own coming to faith in, in my college years. But lack of evidence doesn't lead to atheism, it leads to agnosticism. So you're right to start there. Uh, Alvin Plantinga gives this example. He said, we don't have any evidence about whether there are an even number of stars in the universe or an odd number of stars in the universe. We have no evidence about that. So it would be very odd then to conclude that there is not an even number of stars in the, in the universe or that there is not an odd number of stars in the universe. No, lack of evidence leads to agnosticism, not to atheism. So your starting point is correct. And once you get to agnosticism, you're in a really interesting place because then you're saying that there is the very real possibility of God existing. And then that raises the question, well, what should we do now? Should we remain agnostic just because God is something that we can't fully comprehend? I'm not sure about that. There's all sorts of things in life that we can't fully comprehend. Having a child, uh, that's certainly something that you fully can't comprehend, can't fully comprehend both, I guess, unless you've had a child. I mean, actually, even if you have had a child, you can't fully comprehend <laughs> especially, yeah. that. Especially <laughs> if you've had a child, yeah. you can't fully comprehend that. And, you know, Joe and I, we have a one-year-old, our first child, and... You know, we had lots of discussions and a lot of prayer about whether we were going to try to have a biological, our own biological um, child. And there were lots of good reasons for that, but there were some challenging reasons against as well. Maybe it would be better for us to adopt a child. Do we really want to bring in a child to this world with all of its suffering, with all the travel that we do? Could we really give a child a good um, childhood? There were, there were reasons for or against. But at some point, if we just remained in agnosticism, that would, in essence, have been choosing not to have a child. And William James made the same point about God in his uh, essay, The Will to Believe. He said, at some point in your agnosticism, if you continue to say, I defer on whether to step into relationship with God, that is precisely a form of not stepping into relationship with God. Now, uh, Pascal said, in his view, he felt that there was enough evidence to believe in God rationally, but not so much evidence that we could believe in God based on reason alone. And he thought that was intentional. You know, if all God wanted was uh, intellectual assent, he could get that pretty easily. He could just show up in a majestic way. He could have the uh, Greek New Testament written on every atom, and we would find that in microscopes, and then we would just know that God exists. He can get intellectual assent pretty easily, but probably the best translation of the biblical word for belief is trust. And if you want trust, you need to get that in a different way, not just by overpowering someone, but by showing someone your character and building that trust. And so Pascal thought it was intentional that God gives us clear evidence, strong evidence, but evidence such that we would not come to believe in God just because he's overpowering, but based on his character, that we would follow him not just because he's powerful, but because he's trustworthy. Mm. So then we get to the other part of your question. Is it arrogant then to claim to know that God exists? And here's why I don't think so. Because there are many things in life that are only known up close that cannot be known from a distance. You can't know how to ride a bike in the deep sense of the term from a distance. You have to actually do it. You can't be an art critic without actually going to see the art. You can't be a food critic without putting the food in your mouth. In philosophy, we call this non-propositional knowledge and lots of our knowledge is like this. And in particular, our knowledge of relationships is like this. My knowledge of Joe is like this. Pascal said that in order to know the truth, you must love the truth. 
I had to make a decision to be willing to take a step of relational trust towards Joe, to be willing to love her before I could actually know her in the deepest sense. There are certain things I could know about her before I made that decision, but if I really wanted to know her in the deepest senses of the term, I was gonna have to take a step of relational trust first. The existentialists were right about that. Personal commitment precedes the deepest forms of knowledge. Now, there are two ways to choose a coat. G.K. Chesterton uh, used this analogy. He used it in a slightly different way. But there are two ways to choose a coat. One way is to look at all the measurements. Okay, you can read all the measurements of this jacket, and I can make a decision about whether or not I think it will fit. Another way to choose a jacket is to put it on and to see if it fits. Now, I think both ways are important. I never even would have tried on the jacket of faith, unless I had looked at the measurements of science and philosophy and history and sociology, as Abdu and I were doing in the same year, in the year 2000. But nothing substitutes for actually putting the coat on. And once you put the coat on, you know that it fits. And, and no one's going to be able to convince you that it doesn't fit. I'm wearing it. And somebody could, could look at the measurements here and say, but look, the measurements don't line up. That doesn't look like the right size for you. But, you know, I'm, I'm wearing this coat, and I see that it fits. And so the evidence is significant, and it gets us to that point where we have to be willing to take a step out of agnosticism and into relational trust. But ultimately, at some point, we do need to try the jacket on. And Jesus even says, clothe yourself in me. Clothe yourself in Christ. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And for me, one of the things that meant was praying an agnostic's prayer. I used to pray it in my dorm room. God, I don't know if I'm talking to anyone, but if I am, I would really like to know about it. And I think God really honors that type of prayer. He really honored that prayer when I spoke it, and he met me on my knees in my dorm room in 122 Jolene Hall in a really profound and lasting way. And, you know, not that long ago, when I was speaking somewhere, a woman, a woman came up to me at the end uh, of the event, and she said, did you say 122 Jolene Hall? I don't normally mention that detail, but I happened to on that night. I said, yes. She seemed very emotional. She said, I lived in 121 Jolene Hall. And she was about 15 years older than me. And she said, and I spent my four years in college praying for the salvation of the guys in 122 Jolene Hall. She said, all these years, I had thought that God never heard and never responded to my prayer. But he answered my prayer literally word for word for the salvation of the guys in 122 Jolene Hall. Now, if you want to lean in the direction of atheism, can you chalk that up to a coincidence? Maybe. But if there's a God, that tells us something very different. That tells us that long before I ever even thought about God, he was not agnostic about me. He was pursuing me and pursuing me. Fifteen years prior to my even thinking about him, he had people praying for me so that 15 years later on that floor in 122 Jolene Hall, I could give my life to him. Is it, could it be the case that he's pursuing you and he's been pursuing you long before this evening, but even this evening as he continues to pursue you, he has taken that step of relational trust towards you, would you be willing to take that step of relational trust back towards him? That agnostic's prayer, that seeker's prayer, it's so powerful. God, I don't know if you're there, but if you are, I'd like to know about it. I hope people will pray that prayer tonight if you're not sure who Jesus is. Thank you, Vince. Um, Abdi, if, if God does exist, what, what are some of those implications for humankind as a whole? We have a question that's come in here. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking, why is the existence of God necessary for the intrinsic essential value of the individual? Yeah, that's a great question because um, we, we, we can often think, you know, if you're, if you're an atheist, if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Hindu, whatever it happens to be, like I have people in my life that I value and therefore they have value. But this question actually speaks a little bit more deeply to the idea of necessary, intrinsic, essential value of the individual. Mm -hmm. What that means is this, is that every human being ha would have essential value objectively, even if no human beings in the world valued that person. In other words, what I'm getting at is, is that if for you and I to have an objective essential value, 
our value can't be based on the opinions of other people. Because if they are based on the opinions of other people, then it isn't essential, nor is it objective. It's just incidental. And so the Bible describes you and me as beings made in God's image, that we have an objective, essential value, that we are inherently sacred, not incidentally sacred. Because if we're incidentally sacred, then the horrors of the past, whether it's the sexism that kept women from being able to vote in this country, whether it's the racism that enslaved people and made them property in this country and in other countries as well, whether it's the infanticide of centuries past and not so distant past as well, or the sex trafficking industry now, or the pornography we're seeing where we objectify people, where we humanize our phones by calling them names that we use to objectify humans, by looking at pornography images for our base desires, then we become incidentally sacred or actually just tools of another person's pleasure. Because if human opinion is the basis for value, we are terrible at this. Historically, terrible. I would even say contemporaneously, we're showing ourselves to be terrible at this. All you need to do, and this is not a judgment against people necessarily in times of panic, but this, the, one thing that the coronavirus uh, epidemic has shown us is that we really are terrible at valuing each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. My example is, is that you go and you go to a grocery store and you see the shelves completely cleaned out. Now, is it the case that people are, people are buying reams and reams and reams of paper products or bottles and bottles and bottles of water or cans and cans of cans of non-perishable food so they can give it away? Or is it because they're terrified that they will run out? Now, I, re I, I understand that terror. I get it. I totally get it. But why is that your first instinct? Mm. Because there's something in us that needs fixing. There's just something in us that needs fixing, and we all know it. And I'm not judging a person who does that any har more harshly than I would judge myself as someone whose first instinct is to go do that. But I'm learning from someone else the transcendent source of all human value who tells me I ought to love my neighbor as myself because my neighbor is no less than me. Not because my neighbor thinks so or because my wife thinks so or because the government tells me so, but because God, who is the nature, who is, sorry, who is the um, source of all being, he tells me that those he creates have his stamp of value on them. So I think it's necessary because if there is no God, then human value is a matter of human opinion. Mm -hmm. And history shows us human opinion is a terrible, terrible barometer for your and my value. You don't want human beings to be the judge of your value. Believe me, you don't want that. Mm. But God can be. Now, what does it mean for him to judge, to, to, to be the basis of your value? Mm. It isn't just God in general. I don't think it's just that God exists, therefore you have value. I don't think that works because other systems of belief believe in a God, sometimes many gods, sometimes a, a God that, uh, or a, a system of belief that believes that all of us are God um, or there's only one God. But Christian theism specifically isn't just the idea that God exists, therefore you have value. It's that God exists and proves that you have value. So a friend of mine and I were sitting over dinner and um, we hadn't seen each other in a long time and we were catching up over various things and it was uh, a really nice dinner and he took me out and he said if uh, he, he would pay for it and I said, great, if you pay, then I'll pray and we'll have a nice time. But he was an agnostic, actually really quite, uh, quite the atheist, but he, he called himself an agnostic. I think he wanted to seem at least objective on the issue. Um, and uh, he asked me about my faith journey, how I became a Christian, so I told him, and we centered on the problem of evil, mm. which you described and uh, answered so well earlier, Vince. Um, and there's a lot of different answers to this problem of evil, uh, and one of which, of course, is that we can't know whether or not God would allow suffering to exist in our lives for a greater possible purpose, because the God who knows all past, present, future, and future possible things could know the entire spiderweb of future history and know that though he allows but not creates certain suffering in our lives, that that might exist for a greater purpose we're not even close to being able to understand. And he said, okay, I finally, I agree with that. But his question was this now. And by this time, the wait staff had gone home hmm. or they wanted to go home. All the patrons had certainly gone home and they stopped serving us coffee so that we would just shut up. Um, <laughs> but he looked up from his cold coffee and he says, but here's what we want to know. 
how do I know that this God you're talking about values me or my mother when she died when I was 10? Mm. It's not a philosophical question anymore, is it? Yeah. What do you answer in that particular moment? God exists, therefore you have value. Yes, you can do that. And can you give it syllogistically? Can you give it philosophically? Yes, you can do that. And we did some of that before that. But now it's not just true that he's looking for, it's relevant that he's looking for. There are plenty of things in life that are true and irrelevant. They're nice ideas that don't impact you. But he needed an answer that was both true and relevant. And he was 10 years old when his mother died and he was 38 years old when he asked me that question. And from the passion and the pathos in the way he asked the question, I could tell 28 years of atheism hadn't answered his question about whether he or his mother had value. Did his mother mean anything? You know, Dawkins would say, he says, if the universe were just selfish genes and electrons, meaningless tragedies and meaningless good fortune are what we should, exi- we, we should expect to happen. The universe is blind, pitiless, and indifferent. If there's no God, he's not wrong. Lawrence Krauss says that when you add us all up, essentially, we're just cosmic pollution. We're irrelevant, he says. If there's no God, he's not wrong. My friend's question was, how do, can you say that my mother had value? How do you know anything has value? How do you know? Someone tells you? Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. You know how much value something has by what someone else is willing to pay for it. And you and I can all know that we have an objective, intrinsic, essential, non-communicable value, inalienable value, because the one who created the entire universe, the being who is necessary, through whom all other things come, paid an infinite price on a cross to spend an immeasurable eternity with you and with me. If you know how valuable something is by what you're willing to pay for it, you and I can know we have an objective infinite value because an objectively infinite price was paid for you and for me. Not only is God necessary for you and me to have intrinsic and inestimable value, but God proves it, not just by his existence, but by his actions. Thank you, Abdu. If you'd like to hear more from Abdu on this subject, then uh, check out his latest book, Saving Truth, Finding Clarity in a Culture of Confusion. And also look ahead to his forthcoming co-author book with Ravi Zacharias on seeing Jesus from the East. Uh, We're going to move into our final question of the night now. And this one has come in from Sandra, who asks, why is it, was it necessary for sins to be paid for or taken away? Why was it necessary for God to have someone pay for the sins of humanity? Humankind, why couldn't God just wipe them away himself? I think this is a question that a lot of people have. It's a question that I had as a teenager. I used to really wrestle with this. I used to think, why does God judge people? Why can't he just forgive everybody? After all, isn't that what we've all been taught to do at church and in Mm. Sunday school (laughs) every time that we go? So why then can't God practice what he preaches? Um, But for me, my thinking really dramatically changed on this. Um, I, I, and the trigger for that was when one of my dearly beloved friends went through the horrendous trauma of being raped. And seeing her uh, deal with the consequences of that, seeing her begin to hate herself and punish her own body by not eating and um, exercise all the time because she just didn't feel good about herself and move from one broken relationship to another um, because she just couldn't cope with intimacy and constantly blame herself for something that actually was not her fault. There are actually no words to describe how angry I was that that happened to her or how badly I wanted the person who did this to her and who got away with it to be held accountable and to experience judgment for justice to be served. And I think that's when it hit me that actually, if I cannot stand to see the people that I love wronged and mistreated, then how much more must a God who loves every single one of us more than we could possibly imagine be for the ways that we violate and abuse and harm and damage one another? You know, I think sometimes we can think of uh, of love and judgment as, as opposites, as if they're in conflict with one another, but actually the two go hand in hand. And the truth is that many of you who are watching this evening have been really hurt and wronged. 
And that truly matters, that deeply matters to God. That matters so much. He's not just going to sweep it under the carpet and say, no big deal. But he's going to say, no, I'm going to ensure that justice is served because you are more valuable to me than that. And I think that instinct that love and justice go together is actually something we know in our own culture. I mean, if you look at the biggest social movements of our time today, whether it's about racial equality or whether it's about the Me Too movement or whether it's about environmental justice, everyone of the things that we're most concerned about in the West today all have to do with an issue of justice that we're fighting for because we recognize that actually without justice between ourselves, society doesn't work, relationships don't work, love just cannot exist without, without justice in these conditions. So what's surprising to me is that we turn it around on God and we have this sort of double standard mm. where we don't expect God to operate by the same standards that we ourselves operate by in relationships. But surely it should be the opposite. If God exists, then shouldn't he have a higher standard and a deeper concern for justice than anybody else because he's the only one who can tell right from wrong the only one who isn't just doing what's right in their own eyes but who's seeing the whole thing clearly and the only one who can actually guarantee and ensure that justice will be served when our fallible human systems of justice so often fail people in the worst possible ways that is what we should expect and i think the other irony here is that we're so caught up in justice in our culture that actually we're becoming angrier and angrier with each other. And so actually the thing that there isn't room for anymore today in our culture isn't justice, that we're all about, but it's forgiveness. We actually don't have any room for forgiveness in our culture. And we, and we feel like we can't even have both, which is worrying for us. Because if you, if you take that to the divine perspective, in the words of one of my favorite amateur sleuths, Miss Marple in uh, Agatha Christie's amazing uh, Murder at the Vicarage novel, uh, Miss Marple says this, she says, I would be concerned if when my time came, the only plea I would have to offer is that of justice, because then only justice might be meted out to me. See, the thing is, we want to have justice in our lives and for our loved ones, but we do not want to face justice. Because I think deep down, as Abdu's been speaking to, we know, we see it even in the fact we're raiding our supermarkets, that we're selfish. And that if we face justice, then we're in huge trouble. And so we feel like we're in this kind of ultimatum where either we're going to get justice at the expense of forgiveness, or we're going to get forgiveness at the expense of justice, but we don't get both. That's how it seems to function in our culture today. And yet, what is so amazing about the Christian faith is that God refuses to make that choice. But not only does he refuse, he actually is loving enough and powerful enough that he does not have to. And that is what we see at the cross. Actually, Ironically, Sandra, you will answer the question yourself because the truth is God does just wipe away our sins. He does do that himself. But the way he does that is not by trampling on justice, but by ensuring that justice is served when he himself and Jesus Christ voluntarily comes and serves the sentence that we deserved. He, he gives the guilty verdict, but then he pays it so that we don't have to, so that we can actually go free and receive what Jesus deserved, which was an innocent sentence and and release and pardon and, and the fullness of life. That's why in Romans, the Bible speaks of it uh, in, in this way that God is both just and he's the justifier. Mm. God does both of those mm -hmm. things. And, and what I find so amazing here is that God doesn't only wipe away our sins so that we can have the fullness of life, but also at the very end, it also says in, in the last book of the Bible in Revelation that actually one day there will be no more mourning or crying or sickness or pain. That's the kind of life that Jesus is eternally promising for us, but that actually God himself, he won't just wipe away sin, but he's going to wipe away every single tear. I think how much is that? a hope that we need to hold on to in this moment that we're living in today where we see the sin in the ways that we are just treating one another in this crisis. We see people doing beautiful acts of sacrifice amongst health professionals as well. And to me, I look at that and that speaks to me of the love of God and the way Jesus loved. But we also see tremendous selfishness, which we need God to put right in our relationships. We need justice. We need sin to be dealt with. But, but also, how much do we need our tears to be wiped away? How much do we need to know there is a God who is concerned for our suffering and our pain, a God who's concerned so much that he would come and die that death and suffer for us? 
uh, so that he could be with us in it so that we are not alone in that. And I hope that that is a message that speaks hope to you tonight, wherever you are and whatever you might be dealing with. Mm. Now, we've covered a lot of ground this evening very quickly, and I'm sure that there are all sorts of questions that you still have. And I also hope that for many of you, there might be the time in this season to actually continue wrestling through some of these questions. Now, I know that isn't true for everybody. I'm sorry for those of you who are at home with your children. I know there's absolutely no time whatsoever um, in your household. But, but if that is you, I just want to point you quickly to a couple of other uh, resources that RZM is offering to help you continue to think through these big questions. And after we do that, I'll turn over to Vincent Abdi for any final thoughts that they want to share. But firstly, most importantly, tomorrow morning, we're actually launching um, a new series on Saturday morning. It'll be at 9 a.m. ETD. Um, that's Saturday, the 21st of March. And we're calling it the Saturday Sessions. Um, it, different members of our team across the globe are going to be sharing on Saturday mornings. But kicking us off tomorrow is actually going to be Ravi Zacharias. He's sharing his message on true love in a time of crisis. So this is going to be very timely and an important word. So please do tune into that if you get the opportunity. Um, we also wanted to let you know, if you have questions you're wrestling with and you want to continue asking them, check out our online community, RZIM Connect, where people all over the globe, including different members of the RZIM team, will engage with you to help you think through some of life's big questions. Um, I also wanted to let you know, if you have questions, you can check out Vince and my podcast, Ask Away. Every, every episode will answer a different person's question. Um, so please do submit those. We would love to hear from you. And also, for those of you who are at home and wondering what to do with some of this time, then actually, um, the RZM Academy is offering a special uh, release of a nine lecture course, um, which is going to be available to you over the next three weeks, uh, where you'll get to have the opportunity to hear content from different members of, of our global speaking team. And you can sign up. And once you've signed up, you'll get the lectures and, uh, all at the same time. So you can go through them at your own pace. But it's just available for the next three weeks. So do sign up now if you want to hear more and be engaging with some of this cool content, some of the ideas that we've been sharing about this evening. Um, Vince, why don't you share some final thoughts with us and then Abdi, I'd love to hear from you. Sure. Well, just as you were giving your, your final uh, answer, Joe, I was just convicted at the thought that when we suffer, uh, we're often so quick to look up and, and blame God. Um, and yet, uh, when he suffered at our hands, he looked down from um, the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. I hope uh, that that forgiveness of God has been on full display uh, tonight and that the love of God for you specifically has been on full display uh, tonight. If you are suffering uh, through this uh, time of pandemic, I want you to know that we're praying for you. And I don't just say that. Uh, we're together every morning as a team virtually um, now and in person when we're able to be and we're praying uh, specifically for those who are suffering through this time. And just, just a final reflection that's been on my mind is that uh, you know, we've been willfully socially distancing ourselves from each other for years through technology, uh, through social media, and each successive generation is getting lonelier and lonelier and lonelier. Now we've been given uh, what we thought we wanted, and we're realizing how much that's not what we want, and we're longing for human interaction, and we're longing for a relationship. I would just encourage you um, push into that. Get in touch with the person who you need to forgive. Get in touch with the person that you need to ask for forgiveness. Get in touch with those family members that you're estranged from. Let's be a generation that people look back on, like we look back on, on 2014 and say, look at those Ebola medical missionaries. Look at the way they responded with sacrificial love in a time of crisis. The way we look back on those plagues of the second century and the third century and the things that the Emperor Julian was forced to say in the fourth century because of the way that so many people responded not with selfishness, uh, but with sacrificial love that I believe points to a God that has sacrificial love right at the center of who he is and why he came in the person of Jesus. I hope that's the generation that will be at this time. Mm. You know, um, as I sit here and I reflect on the, the times we're living in right now and the way in which things seem so uncertain and we get questions on, are these the last days and these kind of things, everyone's struggling with anxiety. I mean, people are, are waking up in the middle of the, of the night with knots in their stomachs, thinking about what's coming to the future, what's going to happen, who am I going to see tomorrow, who am I not going to see tomorrow, what if I have a, a loved one who's in the hospice right now, and then there are last days, and I can't visit them. Mm -hmm. It seems unfair, it seems wrong, it seems like we can't find our happiness, we can't find our hope. Um, Peter actually speaks to this in the Bible, 
um, if you, when you read 1 Peter 3.15, you know, it's, this is sort of like the hallmark verse. It wouldn't be an apologetics event if we didn't actually quote 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, but uh, it's important that we do because what Peter says in the context of persecution, he's writing in the context of persecution of Christians when the end seemed near, when they were waking up in the middle of the night with knots in their stomachs, when they were wondering if they were going to see their loved ones because the authorities were going to drag them away or worse. He says, but set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts always being prepared to provide a reason for the hope you have within you to anyone who asks and do it with gentleness and with respect. Set apart Christ as Lord. I think that provides us a sense of safety, a sense of trust, a sense of um, peace and calm if we know that he's in charge and there is a Lord who's out there, the Lord who made the universe so beautifully and so generously, the Lord who answers our question of suffering, the Lord who gives dignity to women, the Lord who answers our social ills, the Lord who um, preserves his word is the one we should set apart in our hearts. But he provides us a reason for the hope we have. Peter was writing in hopeless times and yet he's encouraging people to have hope, so much hope that people would ask them, what's with you? Why do you have the hope? Mm -hmm. If the current pandemic gives us any silver linings, and God is the kind of God who gives us silver linings in times where there don't seem to be any, it's that you might live a life that's so hope-filled that a world that's hopeless will say, what do you have that I don't have? And friend, I'm gonna ask you a question. If you don't have that same hope that you see others having, if you've tuned in because you're lacking it, because you're bereft of it and you're anxious, can I offer you the hope that Christ actually offered to me and offered to Vince and offered to Joe and offered to everyone who's a part of this ministry, including our founder who thought life was so hopeless that he would have taken his own life, but then found hope in Christ, is that you can have a, a life filled with so much hope that people will ask you about it. One of the things that this whole thing has brought to our mind is that there is no peace that this world offers. But Jesus, on the night he was betrayed and then the night before he was to undergo unspeakable suffering, tells his disciples something remarkable. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. See, the world thinks that peace is the absence of conflict or the absence of strife. But Jesus was about to undergo unspeakable, horrible violence. And yet he said, I have so much peace that I leave it with you because I have a peace that the world cannot give. The world cannot give you peace because it is broken and you and I are broken and we can't ever help to find wholeness in a broken state. But Jesus had peace enough to give his disciples who he also knew would undergo suffering for his sake because he had reconciliation, not even reconciliation because he's never broken, but he had the mode of reconciliation for humanity because he had perfect relationship with God and the Father and the Son and the Spirit have that perfection that gives peace that he can offer to each one of us and that you can have, not as the world gives because if anything we found out in the past few weeks is that the world offers you none, but the one who created this world and will redeem it one day will offer you all that there can be we are distancing ourselves from each other and we're finding this separation to be anxiety filling because we can't have the same experiences we once had. We can't go to the nightclub or to the bar and intoxicate ourselves to the point of stupefaction. We can't have the illicit sex that sort of has the band-aid effect of keeping us from recognizing our own emptiness. We can't have the kinds of relationships that are even fulfilling wholesome relationships to things that we want. And we're realizing something that the absence of those things is causing us anxiety. But can I suggest something to you? Is that those things won't cause, won't give you the ultimate peace that you need. It's Jesus who can do it. It's a secular band Crash Parallel said in their song, Rain Delay. It's a secular song and they point this out. And if we see what they're saying is that the, the, the experiences we have in this life can't fulfill us, but someone can, I think we can see something important. They say this, sleepless nights and endless days and waking up from rain delays, selling sex for pocket change and living off the alcohol with no one but a cab to call, lost inside a bathroom stall, this carbon copy life withdrawal. But I need someone to believe in, someone to fill this space with grace, someone to look into my eyes and touch my face, someone to make me strong, someone to make me belong, someone to make me alive. If we've learned anything, is that the stuff we're craving, the experiences we're missing, 
Maybe we're realizing something, taking stock and saying, those things didn't fill me in the first place anyway. But there is someone who can fill your space with grace, look into your eyes and touch your face and make you alive. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are so grateful for the gift of your time. Please know that as a team, we are, we are praying for you, especially for anyone who's really distressed and anxious and in pain uh, this week. And, and we're praying that the God of all hope would be with you, that you would know you're not alone and um, that his love and his comfort would be present to you in a very tangible way this week. God bless you and good night.